Hey everyone, I'm Boo. And I'm Spice, and this is the pilot episode of Random Reads, in which we will be discussing Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. However, first and foremost, at my college or university that I will not reveal the name of on the podcast <laughs> for some pretty obvious reasons, there was a book sale recently where you're able to buy books that the library either no longer wanted. My apologies for the dog. Um, um, either no longer wanted or um, were in too bad of a shape. It was basically a fundraiser for the library. Things of that nature. And we've got a selection here. Boom and I are going to parse them out into either books that Spice wants to read and then gift to Boom. Uh, books that um, Spice wants and Boom doesn't want or books that uh, Boom wants and Spice doesn't want. So, okay. um, Boom, uh, do any of these catch your eye to begin with? Uh, I would say uh, that middle one there, that really big one, ah. is jumping out at me. <laughs> so it's the Norton Anthology of African American Literature. Uh, have you ever heard of the Norton Anthology series? I have. Yes. So I own two Norton Anthologies right now. I got them for an American Lit class. Nice. They're the um, North American, um, or the Norton Anthology of North American Lit 1 and 2. And uh, this will make a nice addition to the collection. Heck yeah. If you'd like to like to leaf through it before I put it up on my shelf, it's got, um, on the back it says, 13 major works including the complete uh, Frederick Douglass's narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, The Souls of Black Folk. Um, there's A Raisin in the Sun on here, Toni Morrison's Sulla. Uh, and August Wilson's Fences, which that's a pretty, like, August Wilson in general is a big um, playwright in African-American um, literature and has had a revival as of late. Wow. Yeah, that's that's quite a find, especially something that you're already, like, keeping there. Oh, yeah. That'd be nice to... Yeah, I think it's neat. And it's in good shape, too. Oh, yeah. Holy cow. Yeah, that thing is... I, I can't believe someone gave that away. I'm sure there's more recent editions. Yeah, but, but I mean, this is, I mean... Yeah, it's not like Frederick Douglass is aging a day. Like, it's, you know, it might not have the most up-to-date additional contemporary works, but the ones it does have are complete. So that's nice. Yeah, wow, that looks awesome. So that's one. If you decide you would like to take a look at it, let me know. That one's not. That one's I'm definitely keeping for. Yeah, heck, I, I totally for posterity like. sake. Nice. Um, number two. What else sticks out to you? I'll move these closer to the center of the table. So yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> um, well, I see you have Elantris there from our, our pal Brandon Sanderson. Did you hear about it before this? Uh, I did. Yeah, that's a. I think it's just one of his earlier yeah, works. Yeah, I think so it's his first. Uh, yeah, a lot of. I think it's his. Yeah, the first published thing he did. So a lot of people mm -hmm. use that as like a comparison tool for what, you know, he, he's done after that. I wouldn't mind reading it. I think I might read it and then give it to you. It might be the plan. Is it a part of a trilogy? Do you know? No, I think that is just a standalone series. That would be nice book. for um, the subsequent Fantasy Fridays that we do after. Yes. Um, yeah, just to get like a two. one and done. Yes. So that might be the move. I might read that over the summer. Yeah, I hear. I hear it's good. I mean, okay. you know, as far as Sanderson goes. Sanderson goes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then uh, what else sticks out to you? Oh, let's see. Oh, I see uh, Emily Dickinson's poems. Yes, yes the <laughs> poems of Emily Dickinson. Yes, I'm a big fan of Emily Dickinson. You can keep this one, bro. Like, you know, I imagine every single poem she's ever written is public domain by now. Oh, there's like footnotes in here, too, from whoever owned this beforehand. So there might be something fun in here in terms of things you might not have yeah. noticed before. But yeah, you can absolutely keep this one. I have no thank problem you, giving that one away. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, we got some stuff like circled here. That's mm -hmm. kind of interesting. Yeah, I think it's neat. So the uh, spice keeps pile, the boom keeps pile, and then the spice <laughs> reads and then gives the boom pile as one each. <laughs> and they're all knotted up. And then um, what else? Oh, I'm excited for this one. Oh, take your time. <laughs> 73 Ohio poems. 
Yeah, a, a place we very well may <laughs> live, but also may not live. Yeah, yeah obviously. Mm -hmm. That's um, for the ambu ambiguity. I'd never read any of these poets. I I looked through it. They're all pretty local and small time. There's someone real cool in here whose name is Is Said, like, like lowercase i s lowercase said like a or s a i d. His poem's on seventy nine. I don't know how that goes. Is said. Is said. I'll read his bio in a second. So Is Said's poem. It's called Columbus four thirty two. It says, "You got no right to steal the light, people freezing while you be teasing." In the cold, cold winter of 78, where the hawk stalked without a balk, laid and played while very few prayed in the cold, cold winter of 78. Don't stay in bed, the governor said. You got to fight back. The blizzard is just looking for someone to attack in the cold, cold winter of 78. January was a mess. The wind was bold. And oh my goodness, it show was cold in the cold, cold winter of 78. Everybody complained about what was being done with a very slim excuse, because they couldn't have fun in the cold, cold winter of 78. Stores closed their doors, everything followed suit, where the order of the day was shovel and boots in the cold, cold winter of 78. It didn't seem right, everything being white. Some say it was a sin, but the will of the cold wind in the cold, cold winter of 78. Yeah. So it's got a nice um, pattern to it. Like mm -hmm. I, I like how it changes up the... Um, the um, pattern in terms of rhyme scheme at various points. And um, Is Said lives in Columbus and explores the territory between poetry and jazz. So that's the exact kind of person that I'd like to be looking into. Nice. Would you like to read this one before I um, take possession of it? Or do you want me sure. to? Sure. Yeah, oh. I'll go through some of that. Sweet. I'll put this one in the. Uh, in the uh, all right. What's, uh, what's next? Uh, I see you have a Midsummer Night's Dream there. Yes, yes, I read <laughs> this in high school. I performed a couple of scenes from it, and it's um, it's neat in that it it's like a little pocket edition, mm -hmm. and there's little sketches of the playhouse. How it would have oh, been for, that's that's very yeah. cool. Yeah, uh, my girlfriend was in a Midsummer Night's Dream. She was uh, Hermia. Good. And it's uh it's got a pretty little cover. It's got um what's the name of the um the goddess who falls in love with um with the ass, you know, with um the bottom. You know what I'm talking about? I do I know exactly who you're talking about. I don't uh quite remember the name. Well Oberon's wife. Yeah. 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 And um that's yeah, very pretty, very very picturesque and there's couple more in the same vein. There's The Tempest mm -hmm. that also has a really cool cover. And then uh, The Merchants of Venice which also has a really cool cover. Yeah, cool. Those all look like they're you know from the same line uh, yeah. thing there. So they probably all have the similarities with uh, pictures maybe. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think Get an idea neat. of what you're reading as you're reading it. Well, they've got the same playoffs I think. So ah. Sweet. Yeah, I think those are neat. Um, this one, I think we'd have to have a conversation about because I'd like to hang on to these. Yeah, you can do. Yeah, you could absolutely hang on to them. Wow! I thanks, demand bro. them. My wow, girlfriend that's... wants these. <laughs> and um, what else is sticking out to you? I think now the Kite Runner. Yeah, this is a good copy. Yeah, I know the Maze Runner series. I don't know that they're related at all. No. <laughs> Can't imagine it, <laughs> but uh, no. I've never heard of the kite runner. But the maze runner. So I read the kite runner in high school, and um, it's about um, this guy from the Middle East moves to America. It's the fallout of 9/11, and he goes back to get a boy from his home country who he's related to. And there's a lot of like interpersonal politics and um, issues of people feeling foreign in America despite being citizens, things like that. And the Kite Runner uh, explains them in a lot of detail. It's not a super difficult read, that's why they assigned it to high schoolers. 
Although it does have a scene with a sexual assault among kids. So it's a complicated book. I imagine as the years go by, um, the conservatives who actually open up books will, you know, start to raise red flags about it. But um, it's a it's a good one. I wouldn't mind doing it on the on the podcast. Okay. At some point. Yeah, that that sounds like a total contender. Yeah, that, that sounds like a good book. And then uh, we got three more. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's that bottom one there? The Guild? Yeah, so this is um, Shakespeare's poems. It's got oh, sonnets wow. in it and stuff. It's got a cool cover jacket illustration on there. And, um, yeah, the sonnets and other poems is what's in this one. That sounds super interesting. I don't know that I've read a whole lot of Shakespeare poetry. Oh, he's got some great stuff. He's got some real great stuff. I um, I think I'll keep those with the, the yeah, Shakespeare yeah, well, ones. Yeah, well, you got there. it going. Yeah. And then um, I wouldn't mind leafing through that for potentially one of our poetry potlucks, the the new revised one. Yeah, look at us out here. We got some new material for it. Absolutely. We got two more. All right, let's go with uh, Forum. So the Forum, the Poets of the Western Reserve. So that's a place in Ohio at, um, in which um, Hiram College and um, like Case Western reside. And uh, like smaller liberal, liberal arts colleges are all around there. And it's just a collection of poems by people who wrote in that area. And um, I think it's neat. Um, well, there's just one I just ran into. Apology for a Hyperpoetic State of Mind by David French. I should like to tell you that being alone again last night, I went to bed in a cold room like a gothic monk so as to feel my own warm thighs cupping my frigid hands. But in truth, my electric blanket broke down. My wife visited a relative. I'm not adept at fixing things like thighs, hands, blankets, relatives, gothic knights, or wives. That one's pretty funny. But <laughs> yeah, there's some cool stuff in here. This one we could pass back and forth for okay, one of those yeah. uh, poetry pop luck episodes. And, um, last one. Well, probably the most interesting one to me. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Have you ever heard of this? No. So it's a takeoff of Hamlet, where the characters of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, they're, um, they're goofed on in history for being interchangeable and replaceable and not super important to the plot, to the point where people um, in the play interchange them. Like, no, I'm Rosencrantz when they call them Guildenstern, stuff like that. And um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern in the play are friends of Hamlet who are hired by the king to spy on Hamlet and eventually take him over the sea to another country to get him executed. But Hamlet, like Bugs Bunny, switches out the letter for a different letter that says, kill Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. You know, execute them. Mm -hmm. So they get executed. And then there's one line in the rest of the play to acknowledge that they died. It's just, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. That's, that's, <laughs> that's the all line. Us. So it's a play uh, that rose in the theater of the absurd, um, in like existential lit, where really funky things happen because they exist as tertiary characters within a wider plot. And um, yeah, it's a really cool play. I, I'd like to cover it on here at some point, perhaps once we uh, once we cover Hamlet. <laughs> Yeah, heck yeah. Yeah, the, in the distant, distant future at this rate. <laughs> yeah, that's all the uh, all the books that I picked up. Nice, that's a good that's a good haul right there. Yeah, I'm a big fan. And um, with that in mind, back to the uh, scheduled programming. <laughs> so, that's right. Mrs. Dalloway is the third Virginia Woolf book that we've read on the podcast. Um, it is the second piece of narrative fiction that we've read. And um, it kind of goes without saying, it's the best that we've read thus far. I enjoyed it a lot. Boom, how did you feel about it? Yeah, I enjoyed it quite a bit. For me, it has a lot of like similarities to, to The Lighthouse, like just in the way that she writes, you know, like the characters yeah. and the way that, you know, you can really get into their feelings and how they're thinking during certain scenes and 
that was very human. Uh, but I feel like it's a lot easier to follow in a sequence how, you know, if To the Lighthouse, it's a little bit, you know, that's a really difficult book to get through sometimes. Yes. I did not find that to be the case with Miss Dalloway. That yeah, was, I marched right through yeah. Mrs. Dalloway. I, I think I read most of Mrs. Dalloway on a plane. Like I, yeah. I picked it up while I, um, while I was in New York for the, um, for that exhibit. Yeah, that yeah. I, I remember yeah. you telling me like, like I am, I'm almost done with it. Like yeah. after just picking it up. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, I was similar. Like I, it took me a long time to get started with it, just with stuff going on. But it like within a week of cracking it open, it was it was done. There's some really cool stuff in it. Uh, boom. Do you want to uh, flip to your first dog here? Yeah. I was just going through these today, thinking about what I was, what I was seeing at the time. Oh, so it's more of a, it's more of a section I think that I, I was, I was really liking. It's uh, so Elizabeth is with Miss Kilman. What page? It is one thirty-two. Okay. And it's kind of like the whole second half of it going into one thirty-three, and yeah. it's how it's just Miss Kilman's like in her thoughts about she's talking with Elizabeth and like yeah. doesn't want her to leave you know she doesn't feel like she wants her to stay there so she starts talking about herself and like you know doing like a whole like pity me kind of thing and yeah. just uh, and just the way she describes Elizabeth as like an animal in the headlights that is just about to run away and she's trying to prevent it like some dumb creature who yeah. has been brought up to a gate for an unknown purpose and stands there longing to gallop away. Elizabeth <laughs> always sat silent. Was Miss Kelman going to say anything more? That's funny. Uh, don't quite forget me, said Doris Kilman. Her voice quivered. Right away at the end of the field, the dumb creature galloped in terror. The great hand opened and shut. That's funny. I, uh, I don't know, that's, that's really cool imagery right there. Yeah, yeah, I feel like uh, I feel yeah. It's just and that's just like a lot of what uh, Virginia Woolf writes for me is just like such relatable things. You know, yes. like that's that's totally something that I've done with someone. I just you know maybe it's like a friend you haven't seen in a while, yeah. or like maybe you just like messed up some conversation, mm -hmm. and you're like, no way. I just want to. Oh, yeah, I, <laughs> I just literally want to gallop away. <laughs> and you do feel like some big dumb animal. <laughs> Uh, well, do you have a second one? Um, you can go ahead with one. Let's see. I'm like I've got a few in here. I just can't find where I, what I was. Yeah. What exactly was the string I was on? So mm -hmm. on page 25, I'm not sure what I saw in it. Um. So it's cool the minimalist sort of language she has going on here with Doctor Holmes, who um. It's one of the more interesting characters in the play because you kind of or in the um, in the book because you kind of assume he doesn't come back and then at the end where he's discussing the guy who kills himself and um, it sort of ruins the party and it's nice to have it at the beginning where it's like um, um, I don't know it's very minimalist here like there was his hand there at the dead white things were assembling behind the railings opposite but he dared not look Evans was behind the railings. What are you saying, said Reza, suddenly, sitting down by him. Interrupted again. She was always interrupting. Away from people. They must get away from people, he said, jumping up. Right away over there, where there were chairs beneath a tree, a long slope of the park dipped like a length of green stuff, with a ceiling cloth of blue and pink smoke high above. And there was a rampart of, or there was a rampart of far, irregular houses, hazed in smoke. The traffic hummed in a circle, and the right... Uh, thun colored animals stretched long necks over the zoo uh, palings, barking, howling. There they sat down under a tree. Like, in terms of the language here beforehand, like, what are you saying? And then she goes on to say, like, look, 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 she repeated. Like, it, in terms of what's actually being said, it's very minimalist, mm -hmm. but what's going on in the scene is painted to be very complex by, um, by Virginia. Yeah, wow. There's a lot going on there in terms of just like, imagery. Well, there's um, there's a cool line on 11 
and at the uh, at the top where it says um, um, but only this astonishing and rather solemn progress with the rest of them a Bond Street this being Mrs. Dalloway not even Clarissa anymore this being Mrs. Richard Dalloway that feels like the sort of thing that Virginia Woolf would write and then shudder like, <laughs> yeah, be, absolutely. Be boxed in like that. Like, she's no longer her own person. Uh, do you want to look at one of your dog ears? I don't know that I have any more that I know of. That's okay. No, I was, uh, this one I was swapping between because I was really eager to get it done. Yeah. So, <laughs> we were trying, we've been trying to record this one for a, for a while here. For so long. So, uh, yeah, I, was, I ended up doing almost all of it in a day at work uh, just on the audio book uh, there's a point on 79 moving into 80 where they say e everyone if they were honest would say the same one doesn't want people after 50 one doesn't want to go on telling women they aren't pretty that's what most men of 50 would say Peter Walsh thought if they were honest that is a crazy sentiment to be put in a book by a woman and you know she didn't actually believe that. But I wonder if she actually believed that. Mm -hmm. Men believed that. Because I could not imagine being one of those people. Like, just being, like, absolutely disgusted by a 50-year-old woman when you're a 50-something. When you're a 50-year-old man. Yeah. man. <laughs> that seems a little bit ridiculous. Yeah. Um, let me see. All this pother of coming to England and seeing lawyers wasn't to marry her, but to prevent her from marrying anybody else. And that was what tortured him. That was what came over him when he saw Clarissa so calm, so cold, so intent on her dress or whatever it was, realizing that she might have spared him what she had reduced him to, a whippering, sniveling old ass. And it's like, Clarissa did not turn down Walsh for anything other than just, like, political reasons. Like, it's not like he, she was, you know, incredibly mean to this guy. She wasn't interested. She wasn't No, they, like, they didn't end up being compatible. He was no. a little bit too over the top for yeah. her for what she wanted yeah. and it didn't end crazily like no. yeah like she got with a guy that made more sense for her and they weren't compatible and now he's going psycho about this yeah and she and she didn't regret it you know like there's a lot of interaction between them like after he gets back and stuff and they have that whole conversation yeah. where he gets super spun up and he's crying and stuff and she's like man you know like I really you know I appreciate how passionate this guy is but I'm really glad that I didn't marry him yeah. <laughs> because Richard is just so much more stable and that's yeah. what I want you know so she it's not a decision that like it's not her loss <laughs> she's he's the only person who's upset in this interaction Oh man, there's this point where uh, Doctor Holmes is essentially gaslighting that World War One, World War yeah. One vet. Uh, he says, um, "But he can." Or this is on ninety one. But he continued, "Health is largely a matter in your own control. <laughs> Throw yourself into your outside good. interest. Take up some hobby. He opened Shakespeare, Antony and Cleopatra. Push Shakespeare aside. Some hobby," said Doctor Holmes. For did he not owe his own excellent health? And he worked as hard as any man in London to the fact that he could always switch off from his patients to onto old furniture. And what what a very pretty comb, if you might say so, Mrs. Warren Smith was wearing. And it's like, dude, this is so bad. This yeah, the way <laughs> the way that Holmes treats uh, uh, Septimus, yeah, Septimus is just absolutely it's absolutely wild, but. Considering the time period that they're in, I mean, that's probably, like, just what care was like for them. It's like, what are you doing? You have no idea. Like, this is just ridiculous. Look what you're doing to your wife. And, like, and there's some humor in this, but, like, this is how women were treated back then really bad. Mm -hmm. Like, when there were, like, mental diseases that were just prescribed to women, just, like, hysteria and stuff like that. Crazy. I, um, I feel like... This is similar to Van Helsing in Dracula, but with that, it's not played for laughs. The fact that they do blood transfusions with random vials of blood. Mm -hmm. That is weird and funny, but not to Bram Stoker. I feel like Virginia Woolf sees some humor in this. Like some dark humor, but some humor in this. And then on 118... 
Um, let's see. What did I want to say about 118? I've not looked at this book in several months. Um, oh, yeah, there was just this surprise about Richard coming in. And, like, he just leaves so abruptly and does, he doesn't wind up going to the party, no? He winds up going to do some, like, more political stuff, some more, like, schmoozing. Which is crazy to me, knowing that, like, if Cameron were to host a party, you would be there for sure. Yeah. If my girlfriend, Jenna, were to host a party, I'd be there for sure. Peter, Wal or not Peter Walsh. Peter Walsh is there. That weird yeah, sycophant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but... No, no, not her husband. Not yeah, Richard. and that's something uh, that that's like a similarity between uh, to the lighthouse too. Just the kind of relationship that Miss yes. Mrs. Dalloway and her husband, and then uh, the, I can't remember names, but yeah. the husband and wife in uh, to the lighthouse. So are cold and with dismissive. The, yeah, being, being cold, not being able to say "I love you." I think that was a like a same thing that happened where they're sitting in a room together, mm -hmm. and they're both like feeling that how they want to say it and then they just don't yeah richard like buys flowers and is like i'm going to give these to her and i'm going to tell her i love her yep. and then he gets there and like something you know they talk for a little bit he does give her the flowers and then just is out yeah, crazy isn't able to do it um there's this point at the bottom of 123 where um miss uh miss kilman's really um unhappy like, it says, uh, she had been cheated. Yes, the word was no exaggeration, for surely a girl has a right to feel some kind of happiness. And she had never been happy. With, what with being so clumsy and so poor? And then, just as might have had a chance at Miss Dalby's school, the war came, and she had never been able to tell, to tell lies. Miss Dolby thought she would be happier with people who shared their views about the Germans. She had had to go. It was true that the family was of German origin, spelt the name Kilman in the 18th century, but her brother had been killed. They turned her out because she would not pretend that the Germans were all villains. I, I think that's an interesting thread there. The whole thing about, like, it, you know, we, we encounter this somewhat today with Russia and everything. Yeah, absolutely. That's been, that's a common theme. Like, any time we're in a conflict with any country like how citizens of the United States with that kind of dissent seem to get a poor lens put on them yeah. for no reason and then in this case though it's trickier because they're they, they share borders like I know England's like essentially an island but they're right next to each yeah. other they're right next to each other or you go okay Germany's right next to France which is right next to England and it's a little bit trickier. Like it, I don't know. It it's it's very easy to sympathize with Mrs. Kilman without being like, yeah, I would agree with her back then. I don't know. Like it's sort of like those studies where it's like when they're like, hey, you probably would not be an upstander in Nazi Germany. It's like one of those. Like mm -hmm. you probably would also condemn Miss Kilton, and whether you're right in that or not is tricky because I don't. Know, they didn't know the full extent of what the Germans yeah. were doing back yeah. then, not for a while, I presume. And even then, I mean, she's a civilian, not even in Germany. I don't. I don't even know what else you can do with with that. Um, there's a point where. Um, Septimus is crying on 140. Um, it says, um, and once they found the girl who did the room reading of uh, one of these papers in fits of laughter. It was a dreadful pity. That made Septimus cry out about hum human cruelty. How they tear each other to pieces. The fallen, he said, they tear to pieces. Holmes is on us, he would say. And he would invent stories about Holmes. Holmes eating porridge. Holmes reading Shakespeare. Making himself roar with laughter or rage. For Dr. Holmes seemed to stand for something horrible to him. Human nature, he called him. Then there were the visions. He was drowned, he used to say, and lying on a cliff with the gulls screaming over him. He would look over the edge of the sofa down into the sea. Or he was hearing music. Really, it was only a barrel organ or some man crying in the street. But lovely used to cry, or used to, yeah, used to cry, and the tears would run down his cheeks. 
which was to her the most dreadful thing of all, to see a man like Septimus, who had fought, was brave, crying. There's some really cool imagery in here. Like, peering over the sofa and, and into the ocean. Mm -hmm. That's that's crazy. I can't imagine thinking of that at a time before cell phones. Before you could really conceptualize something like that, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I guess I, I didn't even picture it like that. <laughs> that the time she's writing this is... That's, that's an, an imagination. That is some crazy imagery. And I, I mean, just like to capture like that, you know, what Septimus is going through, you know, because like I've, you know, been where I work, I've yeah. worked with a lot of people who suffer from like yeah. PTSD, shell shock, something yeah. like that. And like, like it's, uh, I was talking with uh, one of these military people. I, I don't know if I've said it, but I'm, but uh, you have to give away the branch. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm a member of a military. <laughs> Say, I'm a military, and uh, yeah, I was talking. You know, I've been talking with uh, one of you know, our old guys. He, uh, you know, not in World War One, but he's been in a couple. Uh, he's been overseas a few times, and like the way that he describes what what will happen to him as he sits on his couch, it's very. I mean, it's very similar the way that you're like transported back yeah. to where you were, and the way that she can capture that just. It is is very Nuts. interesting to read, and impressive. I mean, I, it's she's definitely done a lot of either research or thinking about that. That is neat. That that is neat that she's able to can't capture all that. And then um, there's the point where Sally Seton shows up on 171. That was the twist that I texted you about. Ah, yeah. That Sally Seton <laughs> came back mm -hmm. despite her being out of her life forever. Um, yeah, there's a lesbian romance in this as not just a subplot, probably the most sub prominent subplot at the beginning of the book, besides the Septimus stuff, which I think is really bold. Um, it says on 171, Clarissa, that voice, it was Sally Seton. Sally Seton, after all these years, she loomed through a mist, for she hadn't looked like that Sally Seton when Clarissa grasped the hot water can. To think of her under this roof, under this roof, not like that. All on top of each other, embarrassed, laughing, words tumbling out, passing through London. Heard from Clara Hayden. What a chance of seeing you! So I thrust myself in without an invitation. It. You can tell that Virginia Woolf, whether she herself was into women or not, I'm not privy to that, uh, or whether or not she was able to be open about it. She had a good grasp on romance, regardless of how it worked out for her. She had marriages and stuff that weren't the happiest. Mm -hmm. And, um, like, she had a good grasp on what she'd imagine a good romance would be. Yeah. Even if she never experienced it herself. Absolutely. And the relationship between uh, Clarissa and Sally Seton were, mm -hmm. like, the way that she describes it, even now, like, that she's with Richard, uh, she was reminiscing at one point, and, you know, she's like, you know, no man, I can't even, I'm not even concerned with what's happening now because I can say for certain that I've known true passion and it's talking about the time that she spent with Sally so yeah. if like just yeah that that's a, a really good insight from her like I, I agree I agree and then uh, 178 there's some cool imagery here it says um where does this sentence start this is one long sentence um <laughs> Sending to uproot orchids, startling blossoms never beheld before, but she painted in watercolor. An indomitable English woman, fretful if she dis if disturbed by the war, which dropped a bomb at her very door from her deep meditation of her orchids and her own figure journeying in the sixties in India. But here was Peter. Come and talk to Aunt Helena about Burma, said Clarissa. And yet he had not had a word with her all that evening. I I thought it was interesting, one, the way people talked about India throughout this, like, I don't know, a subjugated land by the English that we found not long after this to be, you know, brought independence by Gandhi's um, Satyagraha movement. And um, I think it was cool to see, um, like, these post-war or mid-war sort of reflections 
Like, you and I have never experienced a bomb on our doorstep, our literal doorstep. And I can't imagine it'll ever happen. So I, that's, I don't know, that's some cool imagery. Especially yeah, for that's powerful. in our 70s. Or 80s. Uh, there's this point on 180 where it says, For she never spoke of England, but this isle of men, this dear, dear land, was in her blood without reading Shakespeare. And if ever a woman could have worn the helmet and shot the arrow, could have led troops to attack, ruled with indomitable justice, barbarian hordes, and lain under a shield noseless in a church, or made a green grass mound on some primeval hillside, that woman was Millicent Breton. Debarred by her sex and some truancy, too, of the logical faculty, she found it impossible to write a letter to the Times. She had the thought of the Empire always at hand, and had acquired from her association with that armored goddess her ramrod bearing, her robustness of demeanor, so that one could not figure her even in death parted from the earth or roaming territories over which, in some spiritual shape, the Union Jack had ceased to fly. To be not English, even among the dead, no, no, impossible. That is cool, cool imagery, and that echoes, um, like, a room of one's own quite a bit. Yeah, oh my goodness. She had the chance. She would be on the front lines, but she's a woman. She's meant to be in the kitchen. She's meant to, you know, be subjugated. Which is crazy, because nowadays you'll read stuff where it's like, if men get drafted, the women need to cook and clean. It's like, one, men are getting drafted. It's not here. <laughs> it's, it's never. It's not going to happen again. again. Yep. And two, they've been doing that, and now you've stopped getting drafted. So what's the obligation? <laughs> oh man, I'm trying to see if there's anything else interesting out here. Um. Oh yeah, there's the point where um, the doctor is at the party on um, 183. A young man, that is Sir William, is telling Mr. Dalloway, had killed himself. He had been in the army. Oh, thought Clarissa, in the middle of my party, here's death, she thought. She went on to the little room where the Prime Minister had gone with Lady Breton. Perhaps there was somebody there, but there was nobody. The chair still kept the impress of Prime Minister and Lady Breton. She turned deferentially, he sitting four square authoritatively. They had been talking about India. So there's that point where it's like, um, her decrying people bringing up this dude's death in the middle of her party. I thought it was so, so crass. I like how she's willing to make her character, after reading it for um, nearly 200 pages, just be the worst. Like, <laughs> Yeah, it kind of shows, you know, because, I mean, she is, like, high society. Wants to be. She's very petite bourgeois. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a definitely a cool thing to bring up, how, you know, like, something... That we just got to experience, like the whole thing with, uh, with uh, the soldier, his name. <laughs> we just went, we went through it all, and him jumping out the window, and then for her, it's just, just bad news man. at my party. Yeah. <laughs> like, why would you say that at my party? Just, just kind of that uh, dichotomy there of two different points of view on the world. That's about it. That's about it for my uh, my dog years. Boom! Did you like this book? I did like this book, Spice. How, how did you feel about it? I enjoyed it. What was your favorite part? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. We just went through a lot of good parts. Hmm. I probably most liked... Uh, I think I liked the party. Like, just as like a whole, uh, and just kind of how having all of these characters that we've got to have a little bit together and you yes. know get a little bit of for you know a little bit about how they feel about each other and then they all get there and having them interact with each other in one way and then right away the way that she writes where you get their thoughts and feelings are like you know either dissing somebody yeah. you know they're like oh, yeah oh, it's so good to see you and then like oh i can't believe she came here like that <laughs> or, or like that smock. yeah it's just it's just a really interesting way that she writes people interacting. I agree. I think the way that the subplots dovetail is really cool. Mm -hmm. It's like that sort of modern convention of sitcoms where it's like A plot, B plot. They run concurrently and merge at the end. Yep. It's like that, there. especially with Sally Seaton. You're glad she came back. Or Seton. And then the suicide at the end, like it coming up at the party, That's the, that, that put the cherry on top of the cake for me. Mm -hmm. That was great. Yeah, it's 
there. Very well done. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and for me, it's just like, it's like all of the good things. Cause we had a lot, you know, we had a couple of things we really liked about to the lighthouse. And then it just brings like all of those good things and uh, not so much any of the confusingness. Yep. It, uh, it's kind of similar in that it's very, not a whole lot actually, like in terms of length, it's just yep. one day that they're all experiencing like to the lighthouse they're just thinking about going to the lighthouse time pat and they don't time passes and then they do go this is i mean they're just she's just getting ready for a dinner party meets a couple acquaintances and old friends and then they have a party yeah you'd never know based on the description how good a book this is it's very good easily my favorite virginia wolf we've done yeah, so far absolutely and it being the last thing we've read it makes me very excited to read the next one we've got. Yeah. Um, so the next book in general that we're doing, we're going to be covering Lies of Locke Lamara. And uh, who's the author for that one again? Scott Lynch. Scott Lynch. It's currently a trilogy. Potentially we'll have more depending on um, how, he, um, how he gets on in terms of his writing. I hope he's well. And then we are, our, we are revamping uh, Poetry Potluck in terms of uh, instead of picking individual poems, we'll be leafing through collections and anthologies of poetry and then covering them in whole on the podcast mm -hmm. with our favorites selected. Um, of these collections of poetry that I have in front of me, um, are any of these sticking out to you in terms of things you'd like to leaf through yourself? Um, which one was it? I'm excited for the, uh, for the Ohio poets for no specific reason. Yeah. Uh, might as well be California. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Iowa. I, yeah, I've heard Ohio is is a cool place. Tony Morrison's people. from Ohio. Yeah, exactly, right? exactly. We've read we've read a lot of people from there. Would you like to leaf through <laughs> this for um, yeah, for the podcast, and then I'll yeah, pass back off. To me. Yeah, yeah. I started the uh, Billy Collins one eighty one. Okay. So I'm currently in the middle of doing that. I'll get that to you ASAP. Yeah, hopefully. I'm, I'm yeah. excited to do this Emily Dickinson one. I know yeah. when we were doing. The potluck before I brought, I think I brought a couple of hers yeah. on here. I'm, I'm a fan yeah, of the way good. she I writes like those. Kids. Yeah, I think that's what it is for me too. And uh, only interest we can cover in the coming weeks at some point. Would you? Mm -hmm. So I was meaning to ask you off the podcast, but we could have this conversation on here while we're at it. So my idea was because right now we've got a lot planned for our fantasy series, and now we've got a standalone Brandon Sanderson book. So my idea was. What if we were to, instead of doing the Mistborn trilogy, maybe read Elantris, cover that, and then do like all six of the Mistborns, like after season two? Yeah, How's I like that. that. Yeah, I think that might be a better way to go about it. Yeah, now we've got the whole thing in the bag. We'd be able to handle it in one fell swoop. So we're doing a lot of Discworlds. We're doing a lot of Brandon <laughs> Sanderson's. We're going to be doing a lot of poetry. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think as we start to read, you know, just like the volume that we're reading, sometimes it makes a little bit more sense to kind of group like things. Yeah, like that. Yeah. No, I'm excited for the way we're going to be knocking out these poetry potlucks because I feel I think these episodes are going to be a lot more substantial. Yes. Yeah. Yes. A lot more cohesive. Yeah, yeah. I, I like you know. I like bringing just a poem to each other. But I mean, that's something we could, do, you know, yeah. like that's we could we could do that over a text. Yeah. Just be like, I like this poem. You should see it. There's nothing saying we couldn't continue to do that. Yeah, it's just this is the this main is gonna line be a, of, yeah. This you know. is going to be a nice way to like really dig into either someone's poems or or a collection of poems from different yeah. people and just the way that you know figure out a little yeah. bit about why they're put together that way. I'm excited for that. I'm very excited. Well, I'll have to see uh, once Bam gets his poetry book yeah. together. Yeah, bring that to that. a potluck. Uh, he's, he's been having trouble keeping them to himself. He's, he's a poetry writing machine. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> oh, no. Did we ever explain the rationale behind Random Reads? Um, Maybe during that intro. Yeah, I think we did the intro. Yeah. I might need to... I don't know if that ever got posted or not. I think it might have. I don't know. I don't know. We've got two things yeah, in the can right see. now. But um, yeah, we're essentially doing this as the um, as a palate cleanser, leaving season one. 
So um, be on the lookout for some new Fantasy Friday stuff before Season 2. And, um, yeah, Scott Lynch's Lies of Locke Lamara trilogy on deck. On deck. On deck. I'm be excited. ready for disappointment. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's so sad. It's like you're oh. ready to be super happy and then less happy. Ready to read two decent books and then a third book. A third. <laughs> a third. There's a last book in that series. And on that note, I've been Spice. I'm Boom. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>